Okay, hello and welcome everyone to our webinar today, Going Global and how to globalize your content and become independent of translation technologies and vendor lock-ins. And uh, with me in the room is uh, Markus Wienmeier, my good old friend from Germany here. And uh, we will guide you through a couple of things uh, when it comes to translation and localization of your content. So um, I'm Stefan Gens. I'm the senior worldwide evangelist for technical communication at Adobe. I'm with Adobe for more than six years now, and I'm talking about RoboHelp, I'm talking about FrameMaker, and I'm talking about our DITA CCMS XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager. And uh, Markus Wiedenmeier is the CEO of CREX.net GmbH. Markus, maybe you can uh, give us a quick idea of uh, what CREX is doing. Yes, hello from my side. My name is Markus Wiedenmeier, CEO of CREX.net, and uh, we care about all automation things in technical content processing. So we care about information extraction from any kind of format. It's Word, uh, FrameMaker, or anything you, you have in your company to extract information and bring it to another format. We care about translation management uh, in an automated way, including machine translation processing. And uh, of course, we are doing a lot of things in, in in publishing area to publish to HTML5 or PDF or whatever you, whatever you like. This is what Digital Transformation Service of CX.net does. And the other thing is the information delivery service. Here we are going with our information to the context of Industry 4.0 or IIoT to connect content with your machines and devices. And of course, we are talking here about linked data technology. We are talking about RDF and, and Sparkle to query all the technical information via an API and integrate it in your portals or in your machines and devices or any kind of other displays. That's a short overview of what we are doing. And if you want to automate uh, content processes, we are the right com uh, company to help you to get started in a new way. And if you want to learn more about CREX.net and their um, pre technology-wise pretty uh, cool uh, blog, uh, then have a look at blog.crex.net. Um, they have some interesting stuff there also with automated inclusive language and automated translation and so, so a lot of interesting content there as well. But today we primarily want to talk about translations. And the question is, why are we translating at all? Why are companies investing into translations? And when you ask uh, all these big um, companies in the world, why are you translating your content? They usually give um, a lot of reasons, but the top five reasons are they want to improve the customer service. They want to increase the brand value. They want or need compliance with laws and regulations. And of course, they want uh, to expand their market share and increase sales. This is why about 70% of the Fortune 500 companies translate content to increase their sales in global markets, reach more customers, speak to their hearts with their language, and maintain or increase the value of their brand, meet local customer service expectations, and comply with legal and regulatory requirements. For example, in the European Union, if you want to ship um, dangerous products like big machines, um, then you need to ship it with a translated uh, technical documentation. And of course, in customer service, not everyone in the world speaks English. Um, there are a lot of uh, languages, and you need to translate that content into all kinds of languages in the world if you want to be successful in these markets where these languages are spoken. Let's have a quick look um, what companies are spending into translation. And it's not a constant thing. It's growing over the years. And uh, um, this is, I think, from a common sense advisory study. Um, in 2009, they were uh, spending 23.5 billion US dollars in translations. That was already a big number. But as you can see in this chart, over the years, over uh, the last 10, 11, 12 years, um, companies were spending more and more and more money into translations. And the uh, latest number for 2021 um, I have here is um, 56.18 billion US dollars. This is what companies spent into translating their content. So that's a huge amount of money. And the translation industry is quite big, also quite fragmented. That is 
definitely a number, uh, 56 billion US dollars, to have a closer look. Where is this money going or how is this money spent and how does translation work? How is the process looking like? How do LSPs work? And uh, which technologies are involved with that? And this is a little bit what we want to uh, have a closer look at today and how Adobe helps you as a content author and content owner to take advantage of what we have developed uh, in the last years. Translation is a central process in the content lifecycle today. It's a, an integral part of every content production process that a company is doing because pretty much every company that is exporting their products is also involved with translations. And the question is, how does a typical translation process look like today? Let's have a look at a classic typical process. So in-house, that's you, the, um, the content owner, the company producing a product and uh, some content for that product. You start preparing um, your data, your content uh, for the translation. You're sending that to a translation or language service provider, or sometimes also called language solutions provider, which is a term I prefer, in short, LSP. And then the LSP is taking care of the translation and localization process and hands over the target language, the translated data to you. And then you go into the uh, maybe post-production and uh, publish uh, the content in the translated variants on your website as a PDF or whatever channel you are delivering your content to. And these two parts are uh, happening in-house. And in the center, in between there, there's the LSP, the language solution provider sitting, taking care of the technology process of translating your content, taking care of these technologies and taking care of the translation and content review or uh, translation review, post editing, machine translation, all these things, uh, taking care of that. But what is exactly is happening there? What is the LSP doing and which technologies are involved with this? Marcos, what do we have there in that translation black box or red box like it's here on this slide? Yeah, let's see how, how the translation process works in, in general. You provide your source data to your LSP, and then this source data is imported to any kind of, of CAD tool. And this source data format, it's FrameMaker, Gita, XML, whatever, is converted to a property uh, format in, of the CAD tool. After that's converted to that format, it's segmented to, according to the rules of the of the CAD tool, which is uh, configured there, then the translation process starts. We have a pre-translations where segments are checked uh, via the translation memory, and uh, pre-translated text is automatically translated. Not available text is translated by hand or by integrated machine uh, translation systems, and then this translation is post-edited. Uh, proofread it and validate it and store it back to the translation memory database. And then after translation, the translation is exported to the source format and sent back to you, to the content owner. Cool. Uh, by the way, CAT tool is short for computer aided translation. So uh, that's usually a tool like the Cross or SDL Chart or some MemoQ and all the others um, that are in the market. These are usually called CAT CAT tools, uh, like computer aided translations. The bigger ones also call themselves TMS, like translation management systems. You will see a lot of these terms uh, today. So what is the problem with that? We have the, the three steps in the translation process. One is preparing the data. One is translating the content. And the other one is sending back the content to the content owner. And you see the, the five red boxes here. and there we have uh, some some process problems, some breaks in the process where we need to configure uh, the CAT tool for your source data uh, to so that the CAT tool can import the source data correctly and things are marked as not to translate or, or segmented or whatever. And then we have to define some rules, how content or text is uh, segmented uh, in the CAD tool. That's the three red boxes on the left side. And then we have the other thing when we when we send we can when we get the get content back from from the translator as a content owner, 
we only get the content as a single lingual file. So we only get the translated content back and not the, the bilingual file where we have the source segments and the target segments together in one file. And so we get a uh, loose of some important information. You don't get the bilingual data usually. Yeah. Um, we send a source language framework document uh, or robo help topic into the translation process or did a file or did a map, whatever. And what we get back is a fully translated file. Um, but it's not bilingual. And that means we don't have access to um, the mapping between the source sentences and the translated target sentences. Let me summarize that a little bit, Markus. I, I see a couple of um, problems in that process. One thing is process stability. We have a dependency on uh, CAT tools. That's a technology dependency. And of course, we have some human dependency. Uh, and that is the competence of the supplier, the people who work um, at the LSP. Many LSPs are super professional, they have language engineers and so, and can take care of these things. But the CAT tools are super complex and you have a lot of configuration options there. And the language engineer really needs to look at your source data, look how is it is structured, what kind of data format is it, and then configure the file format filters in the CAT tools for specific features of your content. When you think in a framemaker, you need to think of things like conditional text, which might be shown or which might be hidden, or certain um, paragraphs you don't want to have translated, or certain elements that have a translate attribute should be translated or not translated. All these kind of uh, things need to be configured in the CAT tool. And therefore, you have that dependency on the CAT tool and the um, competence of the supplier to handle your data in the exact way you want that. And that needs a lot of synchronization between the content owner and the content translator and the language engineers and project managers and sending around a lot of emails, uh, maybe even writing documentation on how to process your content, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a process stability issue um, that you can have. And there's a process flexibility issue that you can have because once you import your content, let's say a RoboHub topic or a Framaker topic or a Jitter topic into a CAT tool, then every CAT tool processes your content in different ways because they have all written their own file format filters. They all work differently. They are all in different levels of matureness and comprehensiveness of what they cover in terms of the features that Adobe products deliver. And they process this content in different ways. They create uh, different tags, uh, they create different segmentation, etc. And uh, you have the proprietary file format filters that are kept to specific and they segment also differently. They segment the content differently. They um, represent internal information like making a word bold or making a word italic or cross reference or whatever. They all have different tags for that. That's not a problem per se, as long as you want to stay for the rest of your life within the world of one specific CAT tool. Uh, but as soon as you want to go out of that CAT tool and work with some other CAT tool or organize and design the translation process differently with multiple CAT tools, because they have different kind of strengths, then you run into a problem because you fill up your translation memory with all these CAT tool specific segmentations and internal tags, etc. And then moving it to a different system can become very expensive. Even if they are standards like TMX for translation memory exchange, export it from one CAT tool, import the TMX file into the into a second tool, and then rerun uh, one and the same source file through it, you will see that you will get different kinds of matches and um, fuzzy matches and uh, ice matches or context matches or however they are called in these different tools. So you have a dependency there and are sort of locked in unless you reinvest a lot of money into just for being able to switch the tool. Then you have um, the quality control problem because technical errors that will happen always in translations like um, missing tags or um, there's a space missing before a tag. Um, there's a full, uh, there's a trailing space at the end of a segment. All these small details can bring you into trouble uh, in your translated content. And they if the LSV has a good quality control, they will probably catch a lot of these errors, but they will often enough um, remain some errors and you will never, maybe never um, notice them 
until you have published the content and have created your final PDF or final uh, website or whatever. And then you suddenly notice, hmm, there's a crossover that's broken. Damn, why is that? <laughs> and that's maybe because there was different uh, tech injected into the translated content from the translation memory. So you have a lot of these technical uh, small details and problems uh, that can arise. And these are just some of the um, challenges that you can face in a translation process. This is that vendor lock-in part. And basically, you're, once you have decided to go for a specific LSP with a specific cat tool, um, you usually run to the vendor lock-in. And then after a while, the bigger your translation memory has become, it becomes difficult to go out of that. So vendor lock-in, technology lock-in. Adobe recognized this problem. And uh, this is why we introduced native support for translation processes in Adobe Fanatar and Adobe RoboHub. This is, I think that's a big thing because no other um, bigger software company has done something similar. Um, we shipped that out of the box in the 2020 releases in Fanatar and RoboHub. So you can now free your business from these vendor and technology logins with the native support for pre-segmented bilingual XLIF. So we don't just support XLIF, we even support pre-segmented pre XLIF and bilingual XLIF. So for RoboHub projects, FrameMaker documents, structured FrameMaker documents, DIDA, and even custom XML that you can edit with FrameMaker, you can create XLIF files, send them to translation, pre-segmented, and get segmented bilingual XLIF back and import it back into uh, Framework and Drover Hub. And that all out of the box without any extra cost. Big advantage is not only for you, but it's also great for your LSP, your language solution provider, because they are completely free now, or you can make them free um, with, and decide which cat tool they want to use. They are not depending on... Um, oh, this CAT tool A has better support for FrameMaker files, but this tool has a better support for HTML files, and this one has a better uh, support for DITA files. And they would like to um, use the CAT tool that fits best for each purpose. And now they can use just any CAT tool they want because we or you can deliver them pre-segmented XLIF. And the translators can use theirs, or the reviewers can use, can use their preferred tool. So you could design a translation process where, um, let's say, the translator is using a cross, the reviewer is using Charter Studio, and um, the post editor is using MemoQ, whatever tool there is on the market, MemSource, um, XTM, there are a lot of these uh, great um, uh, translation tools with different strengths. And uh, everyone in the process can use the tool they want because the source data format that they are processing, the pre-segment Dixlet, is always the same. And it's not depending from the capabilities of the cat tools, not depending from the file format filters, etc. So you always get segmented bilingual XLIF files also back from translation. And you can open these translated XLIF files in RoboHub and FAMIC and get a fully translated document. And you can even build your own translation memory with any cat tool of your choice, as long as it supports XLIF, which is pretty much every cat tool on the market. So you have that full freedom uh, with that process. But let's have a look uh, behind the scenes. Let's talk a little bit about the technology that is en enabling us and makes us independent. And there are two key things. One is XLIF, one is SRX, and optionally ITS. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, Marcos, what is XLIF? Okay, XLIF stands for XML Localization Interchange File Format, a long word. XLIF is an XML-based bilingual format, text format that can be used to exchange localizable data be between different translation tools. So as Stefan explained before, you can exchange translation data between the systems. And XLIF is an OASIS standard, very important, and it's part of the OAXL uh, reverence architecture. Uh, it's completely XML-based. It's independent of the source format. So any kind of source data can be converted to XLIF and after translation back from XLIF to the source data format. 
it's billing well, and all CAD tools we know support XLIT as it's the basic uh, technology and exchange format for these tools. Okay, cool. Let's have a look at an example. We have a small snippet of content, and let's have a look at that. Okay, a very simple XML or HTML snippet. We have a, a body element which contains all our content. It's in, uh, in the language English for US. And we have two sentences in one paragraph. And let's see how this works uh, in, in XLIF. So we need a process to convert the data on the left side to the XLIF file on the right side. And so we have uh, some, some metadata, uh, the original file name, the source language, which is uh, English. And we want to translate this content to German and the source format was an XML file, data in this case. And for any paragraph, for any block element in the source file, let's say it that way, a translation unit is generated. This becomes an ID to identify uh, this, this paragraph. And the source content is put to the source element file. Very simple, it's just a conversion from one XML file to another XML file with some additional metadata. But it's not uh, segmented at this moment. It's just defined. This is the source content. And let's see how we can move to a segmented file now. What we need for that is SRX, Segmentation Rules Exchange. So an SRX file, XML, defines the rules by which a text can be divided into individual segments. It's all XML today. For example, we saw that uh, paragraph with these two sentences, how this paragraph should be split into its individual sentences. SRX is hosted by the industry association GALA, um, and it's using ICU, the International Components for Unicode, regular expression syntax. You can use these regular expressions to define rules how to split a string of text, like a paragraph, into individual segments so that you can get maximum leverage of the translation memory in the future. And SAX is part of the XML authoring and localization reference architecture, like XLIF, the OXL architecture. It's a standard that you can use, and most translation um, CAT tools understand SAX as well. And we have built support for SAX into RoboHub and Framework as well, so that you can take advantage of that technology as well. So let's look at a simple SAX exception for figure abbreviated FIG dot, uh, so that C figure three for details is not splitted at the full stop. Usually segmentation happens at a full stop. But in this case, an ex special exception for figure, we don't want to split at the full stop because we don't want to have two segments, C fig and second segment three for details. We want to have that one sentence. For this, uh, we need SRX. And for this, we need regular expressions. So here's an example of the rule. Marcos, maybe you can guide us a little bit through that. Yeah, so it looks a little bit cryptic uh, at the first glance. But what we see here are some regular expressions to define a rule which should not break before any kind of white spaces and the text FIG in lowercase or FIG with with the uppercase F. And after that, there can come uh, a lot of white spaces and uh, numbers, figure number three, for example. And this rule says, don't break in this situation. Otherwise, another rule would say, break when uh, there is a dot at the end uh, of a sentence. So we define this rule not to break after FIG dot and uh, any number. But don't worry, um, we ship predefined SIX files in Roha for all supported languages, and they have all the typical um, abbreviations and acronyms uh, already there defined in these SIX files. So with these SIX files, segmentation should be fine in the vast majority of cases that you have uh, in, a, in a source language. But you might have your individual company-specific abbreviations there as well. And then you know now that you can use this technology as well to extend your specific SRX with your company-specific abbreviations so that the segmentation, even for your specific abbreviations, will always work fine and smooth. 
And remember, we will send these pre-segmented files to translation. So you're not depending if the um, translator or LSP configures the CAT tool in the right way for your company-specific abbreviations. You can do that in the SRX files that we ship and extend them with your custom abbreviations so that all CAT tools, not, doesn't matter which one, will get this right because you have, are shipping it in a pre-segmented way. Now you know you can customize that. And quick pro tip here, um, there's a um, company called Max Programs, and they have a lot of cool tools for uh, like a TMX editor, an XLIF editor, an XLIF analyzing tool. And they also have an SRX editor. You see a small screenshot of that here, and that there you can load an SRX file, and then you get all these patterns and rules there and where they break, and you can edit them and test them with sample content and so. Pretty nice and useful tool. I find that very useful when um, editing SRX files. You can can edit these SRX files in an XML editor or even in a plain text editor if you want. But such a um, tool makes it much more easy and um, comfortable to do that. It's free for download. You see the URL at the bottom, maxprograms.com products slash SRX editor.html. And you can download it for free for Windows and Mac and um, edit your SRX files in a more uh, easy way. So... Marcus, what happens then with that SRX file? So, so now we have the unsegmented uh, extra files and we have defined our SRX rules. And now let's see how can we apply or what happens when we apply the SRX rules to the former extra file to get the content pre-segmented. So back to our XML, we add the source content with two sentences and now we applied the SRX rules uh, we saw before. And then we see a new element, it's called segment source with two segments. And you see the here that we have two mark elements with the two sentences. And we see that figure three is not split in a new segment, it's part of this sentence. And that that is what we defined before in the SRX rule. And um, this goes into the translation now. And what do we get back? Let's have a look at that one as well. This is what com what's coming back from translation, right? Yes, yeah, so and this is the B bilingual XLIF file. So we have the source content on the one hand, and we have the target content, which is now German, and we have all in one single file. And we have got the relations between any sentence to its representation in the target language. So. This is pretty cool as you have now a, a small database for your content translated from English to German and you can re reuse it in any kind of process. But the good thing is um, that you can import that bilingual XLIF file with source and target segments into any CAT tool and build your own translation memory or you could just transform it to an SRX file with an XSIT transformation, if you're funny enough. So um, you can build your own translation memory once you get this um, segmented bilingual XLIF file back and start pre-translating your content in the future as well. Let's have a look at how we have done that, uh, implemented, uh, for example, in Adobe Framaker. Um, let me show it to you for Adobe Framaker documents first. We have built in extensive support for Framaker documents because we know that file format inside out, of course. And you can translate and configure exactly in the deepest details what kind of content and which elements of a typical Framaker document you want to expose for translation and make that available for translation in the XLIF file or what you want to hide from the translation process. And this is important that you have these configuration options because um, this makes it possible to exclude content that doesn't need to translate it or explicitly expose content that you want to have translated for whatever reason. So you can configure if you want to have text on reference pages translated. You can configure if you want to uh, have the text on the master pages translated. Maybe you want that, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you have templates already for the target languages and don't need the reference pages or master pages translated, just the body text content then you can exclude this from translation. You can decide what to do with hidden conditional text. Should hidden conditional text be translated as well, because you have just hidden it for, um, for output options? Or do you want to exclude the hidden conditional text from translation? 
how to handle text inserts. Should they be translated? Maybe you don't, you don't have the original text inserts anymore and still need to translate the text insert content. So you can configure that uh, as well. What happens with the document information, with the file information from the file info menu? What happens with translatable variable formats? You can configure if you want to have all variables translated or none or only the one that I, that I actually used in the document. You can decide what to do with uh, cross-reference format definitions. Again, none, all, or only the used ones. Translate the content of external cross-references that are referencing to some other documents. Translate numbering styles. Maybe you're using numbers, numbering styles in Framemaker to create um, automatic text like warning or info, etc. Do you want to have that translated? Yes or no, you can decide that in the filter. And for, uh, additionally, for structured document, what to do with um, the element prefix and suffix, or what uh, what to do with attribute values of elements, which elements and which attributes you want to have translated. And additionally, you can configure if the skeleton, that is the source file, uh, should be embedded uh, into the XLIF file. And this is a pretty cool feature, I think, because it enables you to ship your original source document along with the um, pre-segmented XLIF files into the translation process. And that can be used by certain translation tools, CAT tools or TMS systems to, for example, generate an automatic preview of the translation for the translator. And of course, it helps you to be sure that you can always convert your um, XLIF files, your translated XLIF file, back to a Framaker document. Let's assume you have that Framaker document, you send it out for translation, the XLIF files haven't embedded the skeleton file, and then you get the translated file uh, back. But meanwhile, you might have changed the file or might have lost it even. And what to do then? Then you have a problem. And uh, embedding the source file into the as a skeleton into the XLIF file makes that process very stable and very uh, reliable. And you can pre-segment the XLIF with SIX. If you have a specific cat tool that might not support pre-segmented XLIF, then you can turn that off. Um, you can remove conditional hyphens. You can split multi-level index entries. You can also decide to move that index marker to the beginning of the paragraph so that, that it doesn't disturb the uh, translation of the string. You can configure how to work with um, soft line breaks, like shift return, uh, also called soft returns. Um, should they appear in the XLIF file as a true Unicode soft return or as a segment internal tag, like a BR tag, or should they even maybe segment at the soft return and um, break, um, break the content into multiple segments. So a lot of configuration options. Sounds complicated, but we have a nice UI for that. Um, this is the XLIF export settings dialog in uh, Framework 2020 and newer versions. Um, we have the package file name at the top. Um, this is the package that you create and send it out to translation. Um, there's an XDS file, which is the settings file um, that um, includes, for example, ITS files or the SRX files. You can send that XDS files to a colleague, then everyone has the same settings in the process. You can decide if you want to segment the XLIF and you have for Franica document all these additional uh, options here, like um, what to do with content on reference pages, master pages, hidden conditional text, all the things that I had uh, explained on the previous slide. So you have all these different kind of con configuration options. I think that covers pretty much everything that um, could affect translation in some way on Framica documents. A little bit different on um, data and uh, custom XML files. Um, there we need something called ITS, the International Internationalization Tax Set. So let's have a quick look at that. The International Internationalization Tax Set, ITS, is a set of attributes and elements used to support interna internationalization and localization in XML documents, custom XML documents, but for example also on DITA. And you can use them to define rules how your XML should be handled when exporting to XLIF. So let's have a look at one of these um, ITS rules files. Maybe you can explain that a little bit, Markus. Yeah, so ITS is also an XML standard where we have the, to define rules for any kind of element in the XML file. And so we, we define a general rule. Content in all elements should be translated in any case. And then we can uh, override this general rule 
in this case for elements with an attribute called audience and for the value expert. So any content which is assigned or written for experts should not be translated. And especially in software documentation, we have a lot of parameters and their names. And this is in, uh, in common, this is fixed for, for any languages, so it should also not be translated. And power names within text should be translated. And that's what we define for any element. Basically, basically, Marcus, if I understand that right, uh, the system is that you first create a general rule, like, for example, translate everything or translate nothing, and then you add overrides and exclusions and special cases, um, how certain things should uh, overwrite the initial rule. Yes. In, in our project, we, we, we define each element which should be translated. Uh, so we define elements should not, not be translated. So we have to control a little bit better control, but this sample is um, another approach to that. So in general, anything should be translated and we define rules with, for, for content that should not be translated. That's why the dialogue for framework also, uh, for um, data documents looks a little bit different. So we don't have all of these complex con configuration options there. It's just the translation package, the settings files that contains the SIX and ITS rules. And um, that's basically it, right? Yeah, so, so you can also apply the segmentation rules here, or if you have scenarios where this is not necessary, you can uh, deactivate this and you can also embed the XLIF skeleton or not. And then you can export this user manual to an XLIF uh, format and send it to translation. This is the framework side of things. Um, so let's uh, summarize that a little bit and give you a process overview. Marcus, this is, I think, a nice representation of the flow that our engines go through and uh, from source data to the pre-segment XLIF, right? Yes. So we, so we have any kind of, of source data, the framemaker uh, files or data content, custom XMLs. We get it in our pro process and apply our ITS rules to this to this source data to define the, which content is inline, which content is a block level uh, element or, or content, and which content should be translated or not. And this is the same for data and custom XML. For FrameMaker files, this can also be used in advanced scenarios, uh, but you saw that the, the complex dialogue, as we know the FrameMaker uh, format, we can define uh, this by, by within a dialogue, with an easy to use dialogue, and ITS can, can be applied uh, in advanced scenarios. So that's sort of the first step, and we get a non-segmented XLIF file. And based on this XLIF file, we apply our SRX rule for the target language and get a, a pre-segmented XLIF file out of this. We have also implemented um, translation management in Adobe RoboHelp. So let's have a look at that. What you see here is the user interface of Adobe RoboHelp. Um, on the very left, uh, we have um, the access, we can access the different main functionalities of RoboHelp. In, uh, in the second column, we have the content uh, repository and assets and everything. Then we have that uh, document editing area in the center. On the right, we have the content properties. And as you can see there, uh, we have implemented small, simple um, drop down, translate, yes, no. And this can be applied to a topic on topic level, if a whole topic should be translated or not. But you can also do that for individual paragraphs, even words, um, headings, figures, whatever. Um, or tables or so, and you can um, click just in the heading and say, okay, this should be translated, this should be not translated. So you have these two levels of configuration and can exclude or include things. You could even say, oh, that whole topic on topic level gets translate no, but inside that topic, you do um, have one single table that you want to get translated and then you put it to translate yes, so only that single table will get translated um, in the uh, translation process. So pretty pretty nice uh, configurable options there. On the lower left, you see that translations uh, icon and uh, you can click on it for, uh, to accept the translation management. 
which looks like this. So you have that um, uh, translations column um, where you add all the target languages that you want your content to uh, get translated into. And then you have in the center stage, uh, you have that um, uh, list of all your um, assets that need translation that includes the topics, but can also include other things like um, graphics maybe um, or certain assets that, that you want to attach um, to the translation process. And uh, there you see the file names, the topic status, um, maybe the topic is currently in draft or it's in ready for review or ready for translation or whatever, um, if it's included in the table of contents and what the translation status um, in the specific target language is. So here we have uh, at the top, you see, uh, I have the French um, for France uh, panel open and I have translated that in the past already with machine translation. So the translation for all my topics uh, that are included here are in sync, they're green. I don't have to retranslate them. As soon as I would edit one of these topics or change it or create a new topic, it would appear here as well, and it would switch from in sync to um, to uh, red because it's missing in the target translation completely if it's a new topic, or if it's a change topic where if maybe even just change one single sentence, it would become out of sync. And then I know, okay, this topic needs to uh, need to um, push that into the translation process again because it was changed, or I need to send that uh, into the translation process because it is missing in the translation and I have never translated it before maybe. And of course I have a lot of configuration and filter options uh, in the right, uh, on the right side in the panel. And uh, that is pretty much a full translation management uh, solution for uh, your RoboHub project. Pretty cool. So yeah, status overview and comprehensive filter options. And as a quick summary, as we are coming to the end, um, Adobe RoboHelp and Adobe Framework provide native XLIF support for professional translation processes. Yeah, and thanks to XLIF and SRX, we can send pre-segmented XLIF to translation and get the bilingual XLIF files back. So we have the source and the target languages with us. And the cool thing is uh, there are no more tool discussions. Your language service providers and translators and reviewers and so on, everyone can work with their preferred CAT tool. And so can you, of course. And they don't have technology dependency and dependencies on LSPs and tool vendors. So we have the control of the process on our side. And no more discussions about translation memories. You can build your own translation memory with the kettle of your choice at any time. So you have really the, um, control over that process and also um, sort of ownership about the whole translation process and translation assets that you create with that. So we're at the end. I hope you enjoyed it. A little bit of advertising on our own behalf. We have Adobe Data World 2022 coming up in May 2022, May 10 to 12, and we have three days of program. And last year we had a lot of um, great companies presenting. We had 3M, we had Cisco, we had PricewaterhouseCoopers, Kony, the International Financial Reporting Standards Organization, Sonova, the Federal Aviation Administration, Mavenir, Palo Alto, Briggs & Stratton, Grundfos, BlackBerry, Broadcom, Gulfstream, all these kind of companies were presenting um, on how they are using Adobe Technical Communication Solutions to author, manage, and publish, and translate their content. And from May 10 to 12, they will do that again in the seventh edition of Adobe Data World. Last year, we had about 6,000 people attending. So it's a big, great conference, a lot of uh, fun in the chats as well. So please uh, join us there. Here you have two links to the previous events from 2020 and 21. And we have available um, there all the recordings from all sessions from the last years. So it's a huge library of uh, interesting content from Adobe customers and partners presenting on uh, how they use our solutions. So, uh, and with that, we're at the Q&A section. I will keep that open and uh, then you can uh, ask us some question and Marcus and I will be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you for joining us today and hope to see you in our next webinar. And uh, this was brought to you by Adobe Technic Communication. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>